everyone. Welcome to Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. My name is Ellen and I work at EVPL Oakland. It's kind of a rainy, gloomy fall day here at Oakland, so I thought, well, we'll make our own sunshine today and read some very funny books, kind of brighten the mood a little bit. I've got two really hilarious books for you, and they're by some authors whose names you might recognize. So why don't we get started? Do you like to have something to do while you're listening to stories? I do. It helps me pay attention more to the story and, and listen better for some reason. I'm not really sure why. So if you want to get some pencils, pens, drawing paper, uh, coloring pages, whatever you'd like, uh, you can stop the video and go get those, come back and restart the video, and then we'll start with our stories. Our first book today is by an author, a British author by the name of Neil Gaiman. This is called Fortunately the Milk. All Dad did was go to the store for a bottle of milk, but the adventures he had are amazing. This book is available in print, as an e-audiobook, as an e-book, and also as an audio CD or a book on CD. Um, the really cool thing about the audio editions of this book is that they're read by the author, Neil Gaiman himself, and um, he's got a wonderful voice and reads very well, so you might want to take a listen and see what that's like. So this is Neil Gaiman, Fortunately, the Milk. There was only orange juice in the refrigerator. Nothing else that you could put on cereal, unless you think that ketchup or mayonnaise or pickle juice would be nice on your toastios, which I do not, and neither did my little sister. Although she has eaten some pretty weird things in her day, like mushrooms in chocolate. And then there's a little note at the bottom of the page that said, she did not actually like eating the mushrooms in chocolate, and I had not actually told her that there were mushrooms inside the chocolate. It was an experiment. No milk, said my sister. Nope, I said, looking behind the jam in the fridge, just in case. None at all. Our mom had gone off to a conference. She was presenting a paper on lizards. Before she went, she reminded us of the important things that had to happen while she was away. My dad was reading the paper. I do not think he pays a lot of attention to the world while he's reading the paper. Did you hear me? Asked my mom, who is suspicious. What did I say? Do not forget to take the kids to orchestra practice on Saturday. It's violin on Wednesday night. You've frozen a dinner for each night you're away and labeled them. The spare house key is with the Nicholsons. The plumber will be here on Monday morning and do not use or flush the upstairs toilet until he's been. Feed the goldfish. You love us and you'll be back on Thursday, said my father. I think my mom was surprised. Yes, that's right, she said. She kissed us all and then she said, oh, and we're almost out of milk. You'll need to pick some up. After she went away, my dad had a cup of tea. There was still some milk left. We defrosted meal number one, but we had a bit of a mess of things, so we went to the Indian restaurant. Before we went to sleep, Dad made us mugs of hot chocolate to make up for the whole missing of mum. That was last night. Now Dad came in. Eat your cereal, he said. Remember, it's orchestra practice this afternoon. We can't eat our cereal, my sister said sadly. Well, I don't see why not, said my father. We've got plenty of cereal. There's toastios and there's muesli. We have bowls. We have spoons. Spoons are excellent. Sort of like forks, only not as stabby. No milk, I said. No milk, said my sister. I watched my dad think about this. He looked like he was going to suggest that we have something for breakfast that you do not need milk for, like sausages. But then he looked like he remembered that without milk, he couldn't have his tea. He had on his no tea face. You poor children, he said. I will walk down to the shop on the corner. I will get milk. Thank you, said my sister. Not the fat-free kind, I told him. That stuff tastes like water. Right, said my dad. Not the fat-free kind. He went out. I poured some toastios into a bowl, and I stared at them. I waited. The illustrations are by Scotty Young, and they are pretty crazy, too. They go right along with the story. 
So I waited. How long has he been? Asked my sister. Ages, I said. I thought so, said my little sister. We drank orange juice. My sister practiced her violin. I suggested that she stop playing her violin, and she did. My sister made faces at me. How long has it been now? She asked. Ages and ages, I told her. What happens if he never comes back, she says. Well, I suppose we eat the pickles, I said. You can't eat pickles for breakfast, said my sister, and I don't like pickles at any time. What if something awful has happened to him? Mom would blame us. Oh, I expect he just ran out into one of his friends at the corner shop, I said, and they got talking and he lost track of time. I ate a dry toastio as an experiment. It was sort of okay, but not as good as in milk. There was a thump and a bang at the front door, and my father came in. Where have you been all this time? asked my sister. Ah, said my father. Um, uh, yes. Uh, well, funny you should ask me that. You ran into someone you knew, I said, and you lost track of time. Well, I bought the milk, said my father, and I did indeed say a brief hello to Mr. Ronson from over the road, who was buying a paper. I walked out of the corner shop and heard something odd that seemed to be coming from above me. It was a noise like this, thum, hum. I looked up and saw a huge silver disc hovering in the air above Marshall Road. Hello, I said to myself, that's not something you see every day. And then something odd happened. That wasn't odd, I asked. Well, something odder, said my father. The odd thing was the beam of light that came out of the disc a glittery, shimmery beam of light that was visible even in the daylight. And the next thing I knew, I was being sucked up into the disc. Fortunately, I had put the milk into my coat pocket. The deck of the disc was metal. It was as big as a playing field or bigger. Oh, there he goes up into the spaceship. We have come to a planet from a world very far away, said the people in the disc. I call them people, but they were a bit green and rather globby, and they looked very grumpy indeed. Now, as a representative of your species, we demand that you give us ownership of the whole planet. We are going to remodel it. I jolly well won't, I said. Then, it said, we will bring all your enemies here and we'll have them make you miserable until you agree to sign the planet over to us. I was going to point out that to them that I didn't have any enemies when I noticed a large metal door with emergency exit, do not open for any reason, this means you, on it. I opened the door. Don't do that, said a green globby person. You'll let the space-time continuum in but it was too late. I had already pushed open the door. I jumped. I was falling. Fortunately, I had kept a tight hold on the milk. So when I splashed into the sea, I didn't lose it. What was that, said a woman's voice? A big fish, a mermaid, or was it a spy? I wanted to say that I wasn't any of those things, but my mouth was full of seawater. I felt myself being hauled up onto the deck of a little ship. There were a number of men and a woman on the deck, and they all looked very cross. Who be ye, landlubber? said the woman, who had a big hat on her head and a parrot on her shoulder. He's a spy, a walrus in a coat, a new kind of mermaid with legs, said the men. What are you doing here? asked the woman. Well, I said, I just set out to the corner shop for some milk for my children's breakfast and for my tea, and the next thing I knew, he's lying, your majesty. She pulled out her cutlass. You dare lie to the queen of the pirates? Fortunately, I had kept tight hold of the milk, and now I pointed to it. If I did not go to the corner shop to fetch the milk, I asked them, then where did this milk come from? At this, the pirates were completely speechless. Now, 
I said. If you could let me off somewhere, somewhere near to my destination, I would be very much obliged to you. And where would that happen to be? said the Queen of the Pirates. On the corner of Marshall Road and Fletcher Lane, I said, my children are waiting there for their breakfast. You're on a pirate ship now, my fine bucko, said the pirate queen, and you, and you don't get dropped off anywhere. There are only two choices. You can join my pirate crew or refuse to join, and we will slit your cowardly throat, and you will go to the bottom of the sea where you will feed the fishes. What about walking the plank, I asked. Never heard of it, said the pirates. Walking the plank? It's what proper pirates do. Look, I'll show you. Do, do you have a plank anywhere? I took some looking, but we found a plank, and I showed the pirates where to put it. We discussed nailing it down, but the pirate queen decided it was safer just to have the two fattest pirates sit at the end of it. Why exactly do you want to walk the plank? asked the pirate queen. I edged out onto the plank. The blue Caribbean water splashed gently beneath me. Well, I said, I've seen lots of stories with pirates in them, and it seems to me that if I'm going to be rescued... At this, the pirates started to laugh so hard, their stomachs wobbled, and the parrot took off to the air in amazement. Rescue, they said. There's no rescue out here. We're in the middle of the sea. Nevertheless, I told them, if you are going to be rescued, it will always be while walking the plank. Which we don't do, said the pirate queen. Here, have a Spanish doubloon and come to and join us in our piratical adventures. It's the 18th century, she added, and there's always room for a bright, enthusiastic pirate. I caught the doubloon. I almost wish that I could, I told her, but I have children and they need their breakfast. Then you must die. Walk the plank. I edged out to the end of the plank. Sharks were circling. So were piranhas. And this is where I interrupted my dad for the first time. Hang on, I said. Piranhas are a freshwater fish. What were they doing in the sea? You're right, said my father. The piranhas were later. Right. So, I was out at the end of the plank, facing certain death, when a rope ladder hit my shoulder and a deep, booming voice shouted, Quickly, climb up the rope ladder! I needed no more encouragement than this, and I grabbed the rope ladder with both hands. Fortunately, the milk was pushed deep into the pocket of my coat. The pirates hurled insults at me and even discharged pistols, but neither insults nor pistol shot found their targets, and I soon made it to the top of the rope ladder. I'd never been in the basket of a hot air balloon before. It was peaceful up there. The person in the balloon basket said, I hope you don't mind me helping, but it looked like you were having problems down there. I said, you're a stegosaurus. I am an inventor, he said. I have invented the thing we are traveling in, which I call Professor Steg's floaty ball person carrier. I call it a balloon, I said. Professor Stegg's floaty ball person carrier is the original name, he said, and right now we are 150 million years in the future. Actually, I said, we are about 300 years in the past. Do you like hard, hairy, wet, white crunchers? He asked. Coconuts? I guessed. I named them first, said Professor Stegg. He picked up a coconut from the basket and ate it, shell and all, just as you or I might crunch toast. He showed me his time machine. He was very proud of it. It was a large cardboard box with several pe pebbles on it and stones stuck to the side. There was also a large red button. I looked at the stones. Hang on, I said. Those are diamonds and sapphires and rubies. Actually, he said, I call them special shiny clear stones, special shiny bluey stones, and um, um... Special shiny red stones, I suggested. Indeed, he said. I called them that when I was inventing my really good moves around in time machine 150 million years ago. Well, I told him, it was very lucky for me that you turned up when you did and rescued me. I am slightly lost in space and time right now and need to get home in order to make sure my children get milk for their breakfast. I showed it to him. This is the milk. 
Although I expect that 150 million years ago you called it wet, white, drinky stuff. Dinosaurs are reptiles, sir, said the Professor Stegg. We do not go in for milk. Do you go in for breakfast cereal, I asked. Of course, he said. Dinosaurs love breakfast cereal, especially the kind with the nuts in it. What do you have on your cereal, I asked. Orange juice, mostly, or we just eat it dry. But I shall put this in my book. In the distant future, small mammals put milk on their breakfast cereal. I shall write a wonderful book when I return to the present. Actually, I said, I think this is definitely the past. It has pirates in it. It's the future, he said. All the dinosaurs have gone off into the stars, leaving the world to mammals. I wondered where you all went, I said. The stars, he told me, that is where we all have gone. So, I said, can you take me home? Well, he said, yes and no. What does that mean? Yes, I would love to take you home. Nothing would make me happier. No, I cannot take you home. In all honesty, I do not believe that I can take me home. My time machine is being temperamental. I need a special shiny greeny stone. I have pressed that button many times, but nothing happens. Button? Don't you mean big red flat pressy thing? I asked. I must certainly do not. It is a button. I named it after my aunt button. Can I press it? If you wish. I pressed the button. The sun shot around the sky, and the sky started to flicker in nights and in days, and the balloon began to rock and lurch and zoom around like an angry fly. I held on to the ropes as hard as I could. Fortunately, I was still keeping tight hold of the milk in my right hand. When we stopped being blown all across the sky, it was night, and according to Professor Stegg, we'd only gone back about a thousand years. The moon was already full. I am even further from my children and our breakfast, I said. You have your milk, he said. Where there is milk, there is hope. Ah, over there, that looks like a perfect landing platform for time-traveling scientists in floaty ball person carriers. We landed on the platform and got out. The platform stuck up out of the jungle and had flaming torches on each side. There were people standing on it with very black hair and sharp stone knives. Is this the balloon landing platform? I asked the people. It is not, said a fat man. It is our temple. We had very bad harvest last year, and we had just asked the gods to send us sacrifice to make sure that this year's harvest is better when you floated down in that thing with your monster. Thank you, by the way, said a little thin man. I was going to be the sacrifice if no one else turned up. Much obliged. So we will now sacrifice you and your monster. But my children are waiting for their breakfast, I said. Look! and I held up the milk. Why did they all just fall to their knees, asked Professor Stegg. Is this usual hairless mammal behavior? Perhaps I should hold up some hard, hairy, wet, white crunchers and see what happens. Coconuts, I told him. They are called coconuts. What is that you are holding, the fat man asked. Milk, I said. Milk, they all exclaimed, and they prostrated themselves on the ground. We have a prophecy, said the fat man, that when a man and a spidey-backed monster descend from the skies on a round floaty thing. Floaty ball person carrier, said the thin man. Yes, one of those. We were told that when that happened, if the man held up milk, that we were not to sacrifice them, but we were meant to take them to the volcano and give them as present the green jewel that is the eye of Splod. Splod? He is a god of people with short, funny names. It is, I said, a remarkably specific sort of prophecy. When did you receive it? Last Wednesday, said the fat man proudly. We walked together down a jungle path. Professor Stegg carried the rope in his mouth that led up to the balloon, and he dragged the balloon along. After half an hour, we reached the volcano. 
It was not a very big volcano. There were wisps of smoke coming from the top of it. On the side of the volcano, there was a carving of a big, scary face with one eye in the middle of its forehead. The eye was the biggest emerald I had ever seen. A special shiny greeny stone, said Professor Steg, with his mouth full of rope. It is a good thing that Splod himself told us to give you the eye of Splod, said the little thin man who had narrowly avoided being sacrificed. Because there is another prophecy that if the eye of Splod is ever removed, great Splod will awaken and spread burning destruction across the land. Here you go, said the fat man. He handed us the emerald. Professor Stagg nipped, nipped up the rope ladder to the balloons, a gondola, and began to install the emerald in the time machine. Hang on, he was a Stegosaurus? Yes. Then how could he just nip up a rope ladder? He was, said my father, a large Stegosaurus, but very light on his feet. Are there any ponies in this? asked my sister. I thought there would be ponies by now. And so the father goes on, and the adventure goes on and on. What do you think? Is he just telling a story, or did this really happen? There's only one way to find out. Fortunately, The Milk by Neil Gaiman. I don't know how this happened, but when I chose the books for today, I wound up with two books that have very quirky fathers in them. And in the second book, the dad is so quirky and his son is so frustrated with him that the title of the book is How to Train Your Dad by Gary Paulson. You recognize the name Gary Paulson? He's written so many books for young people and they're all excellent. Usually they have an outdoor theme uh, such as Hatchet, probably his best known book, which is about a boy who's trapped in the wilderness and has to survive. He's also written a lot of funny books. Um, there's one, How Angel Peterson Got His Name, is hilarious. It's a teen novel. Um, he's written Lawn Boy, which is also funny. And this one, How to Train Your Dad, is also very funny. Unfortunately, uh, Gary Paulson passed away uh, last month, and we're very sorry to hear that. Uh, this, is one, this is one of his last novels, and I believe there'll be one more to be published in January that we'll keep a lookout for. But this is a story, How to Train Your Dad, by Gary Paulson. I'll let the main character introduce himself. Chapter 1 is called Dumpster Wisdom. You need to know a little bit about me before you hear all the rest of the things I'm going to tell you about my life. Otherwise, how will you know enough to understand what matters and where it all fits and how everything goes? So, my name is Carl Hemsvet. Don't even try the last name. I'm not quite certain myself how it should be pronounced. My first name came from my mother, who passed away when I was six from some kind of disease mixed with a bunch of complications, which is how my dad puts it. She was wonderful, even if I only have foggy memories. My father says she was the best, but talking about her makes him remember she's gone, and it hurts. So we hardly ever talk about her. Anyway, my mother called me Carly, which would be all right, except it makes people think of a woman singer from before I was born. And I'm a boy who can't sing a hoot, so just call me Carl. So I'm Carl, and I can't sing, and my age is just at that line between 12 and 13, and I look like any other 12 to 13-year-old boy. Here and there a pimple, hair that isn't cool, glasses so I don't squint, a body that seems to belong to some other person who doesn't like me very much. In addition, I'm not very good at sports, which I don't even try anymore. I'm average to poor at school, which I sometimes like, sometimes don't. I've got no brothers or sisters, so it's just me trying to make sense of my father. More on that later. And finally, according to my dad, and the reason for this book, I'm rich! Only I'm not. Not even close. But that's not how my dad sees it. So, first week of my summer vacation, and we were sitting on the edge of a dumpster in the back of the grocery store that's in the mall, sitting up on the edge looking down, smack in the middle of approximately 132,000 flies. Just sitting there looking for stuff to salvage because my dad says stores throw away a lot of perfectly good food when he suddenly announced, you know, we have a rich life. 
Really? He said that? As we were dumpster diving for food. And if that's not crazy enough, here's how we live. We have a small trailer outside of town along the river on five acres of dirt and mud with four, you can come count them if you want, trees. Not big trees, no shade really, just four skinny trees next to a semi-scroungy trailer. There's electricity and a television, which my father never watches, and we can get internet connection, which my father never uses, but only by swiping the Wi-Fi signal from a nearby warehouse for a moving and storage company, and we have a shed that houses two pigs and 11 or 12 or 15 or 4 chickens. The count varies from day to day because sometimes a few of the chickens, the smart ones, take it on themselves to leave. The not so smart chickens not only come back, I don't know why, but every now and then they'll bring a new chicken with them. I don't have a clue where they get the new ones since we are surrounded by, in addition to the previously mentioned warehouse, a plastic shopping bag manufacturer, a ready-mix concrete supplier, a sheriff's impound lot, a school bus depot, an office furniture wholesaler, a shipping transfer station, and a garage for city garbage trucks. There are no neighbors with chickens, or even houses with people for that matter. Add to the picture you're forming of where we live our rich life kind of place, a rebuilt, recycled, rehabbed 1951 half-ton Chevy pickup made up mostly of dents so deep you can see a little, little puddles here and there in the hood after a rain. A truck, my father says, is not only immortal, but an absolute classic. Parked in the mud near the trailer, and you get a rough idea how rich we really are. So you've got me, Dad, Pooter, that's Carl's best friend, and the chickens, and then of course our dog, Carol, who is a rescue pit bull we found limping alongside the road near a part of town where you don't want to go unless you're looking for trouble. Carol is all scars from where bad people had forced her into illegal dog fights, but she's very sweet to us and super protective about anything she thinks belongs to us, including people we're friendly with. But everything else is just plain toast, and she's absolute murder to any skunk that comes wandering along the river and makes a run on our chickens. She tears them to shreds and scatters the strips around the yard, and since that happens at least once a, once a week all summer long, she always smells so bad, flies won't even land on her. Dad loves her, but he also says she sits on our little po porch, gazing over her world, watching and waiting for anything that she perceives as a threat so she can go into attack mode. According to him, she's a loving, land-based white shark, and if you could hold her up just right and look into her mouth, you'd be able to see straight out her butt. Paulson's words, not mine. He calls Carol a killing tube, who also happens to like sitting on the couch like a person, getting hugged and watching television before going to sleep next to you in bed on her back, snoring like an old drunk. What's not to love, he says. By now, you've probably gotten the idea that Dad's a really nice guy, and you'd be flat out right. He's friendly to everyone he meets, and he's always been good to me. So I can see where it might become confusing to learn that the time came when his way of thinking started to drive me absolutely nuts, and I couldn't stand it, or him, or the way we lived for another minute. And it's all because of a girl. Well, not just a girl the girl. Her name is Peggy, and she has green eyes that make me think I'm looking into deep water, and thick red hair, and across her nose is the, the exact right amount of freckles placed in the exact right order. She's in my grade at school, and everyone likes her, and I have never, ever, ever seen her be catty or crabby or phony to anyone ever, which is something like a miracle in middle school if you ask me. And I fell head over heels completely in love with her on the last day of school when I heard her laugh in the hallway. I must have heard her laugh a million times as I've known her since kindergarten. But Pooter says when you know, you know. About soulmates, that is. And I just knew. Only, she doesn't know I exist. And I do want her to know I exist as a guy she might want to spend time with. And therein lies the main problem I have with my dad. I don't fit in because of the way we live. My father, of course, says it doesn't matter that I don't have clothes that make me fit in and help me be look addable to Peg, that all the stuff is just for show and having it is like being on a movie set, all glitz and no quality. And what we're about, again, according to him, 
is quality. But Carl isn't buying it. He remembers all the times that his dad has tried to produce quality. Like the time he tried to make a bike for Carl out of scrounged and bartered and salvaged items. All the pieces and parts were the best. Alloy pedals, the best wheel hubs, uh, great handlebars, everything. You think it would be perfect. I'm aware that this description makes it sound like the perfect bike, and it was. Almost. Because my father is the absolute monarch of the kingdom of almost was. The bike had all the right parts, but it just wasn't cool enough to impress Peg and get her to notice him. Carl is sick and tired of the way they're living, and something has to be done. Carl finds the answer in a 42-pound bag of dry dog food. It had poured out and was almost completely hidden under the dog food, but I saw the corner of it and grabbed it. Usually, those things are just advertisements or coupons for other products they sell, like collars or chew toys. I rarely read or even look at them too carefully, and I barely glanced at it as I shoved it into my pocket to recycle later. I'd caught a glimpse of the text, though, enough to realize now that fate was nudging me hard, and I pulled it out of my pocket and looked down. The pamphlet had a sketch of a puppy on the cover. The print under the picture read, Training your puppy using positive reinforcement. See? Fate! The how part of my dad problem was literally in my hands. Training your puppy. Positive puppy training is all about rewarding good behavior and ignoring bad behavior. All training efforts should be subtle and positive. Under no circumstance should you yell or scold or angrily rub a puppy's nose in its mess. So states the first sentences of the pamphlet. All right, I know my father isn't a puppy and that there are some pretty glaring differences between my father and said puppy. But are there really? My father is a mammal and a puppy is a mammal. And according to science, there are very few differences in the DNA of all mammals. In fact, I think I read, or more likely my dad or pooter read, and then told me as an aside of some long drown out story, that there is only supposed to be a 17 or 18 chromosome difference between humans and lawn grass. And I think in some cases, as with pooter, it might be even a little closer. It couldn't hurt to try, could it? He decides to read the pamphlet and experiment. Luckily, an opportunity to test the training theory on my dad presented itself almost immediately. A garage sale. The basic idea seems simple. Ignore bad behavior and praise good behavior. Since the dog, who I began referring to as SP for subject puppy, also known as his dad, because Pooter said it would, be, it would sound more experimental and official that way when I wrote down accounts of my training efforts in my notebook at night, was starting to do something inappropriate, I practiced ignoring SP and his bad behavior. I didn't want to let SP think I was interested in what SP might be doing and thereby call attention to SP. SPs crave attention. And so he accompanies his dad to, to the garage sale hunts and for some reason, Carol the dog also loves garage sales. I quickly discover that it's a little hard to ignore something your SP and killer dog are staring but, but not staring at as you're casually driving back and forth in front of someone's house, trying to study, not study, the items in the driveway, especially when SP is busy driving the truck that's carrying you. But I tried. I pretended to nonchalantly look out the opposite side window of the truck, away from the prey object, potential garage sale stop, and tried to appear wildly interested in a bird that was flying overhead. Carol fell for it and looked where I was pointing. When she realized it was an ordinary, boring bird and that I diverted her attention away from Dad's garage sale hunt for nothing, she looked deep into my eyes. I got the distinct impression she knew exactly what I was doing and did not approve and then went back to her job of studying, not studying the sale with my dad. SP didn't even glance up at the bird. As we drove past, I could see him fixate on a beat up, rusty rowing machine. Then he shook his head and muttered to himself, nah. We picked up speed and I thought we were free and clear. It seemed a perfect moment for some positive reinforcement. Good thinking, I said. I almost said good boy. 
didn't seem like there was much of anything there. SP didn't respond, and as we made a series of left turns to swing past the garage sale again, I understood that he wasn't giving up so easily. As we passed by a second time, he perked up. I think I see an electric hedge trimmer we might be able to make use of. Then he drove around the block again, pulled up to the curb in front of the sale, and went directly to the trimmer, which he bargained down to two dollars and bought. Carol had her own form of shopping that most people call shoplifting. Using the ignoring bad behavior, positive reinforcement routine didn't seem to have any appreciable effect whatsoever. SP had still worked the garage sale and bought something we didn't need, and Carol had stolen a stuffed bunny. They had ignored me, ignoring them, and did not stop their bad behavior in order to seek my attention. My first attempt at training SP was a complete and utter failure. But with the encouragement of Pooter, and a little help from the pamphlet that he's been reading, he decides to keep trying. He's going to try some rewards. I wonder if he's going to give his dad dog biscuits. Who knows? To find out if it works and if Carl ever gets Peg's attention, take a look at this hilarious book by Gary Paulson, How to Train Your Dad. This book is available in print at several EVPL locations. Well, that's another edition of Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. Thanks so much for joining me today. Miss Jessica will be here next week. Bye-bye.